Hello and welcome. I am Samuel. For those of you who met me on YouTube, you may know me as Razor Slick, who did all those videos of my... That was me. Seven years ago. How foolish I was back then. A lot of time has passed. And I'm only a shell of my former self. The idea was that I wanted to make a video for Halloween. Ghost stories narrated by me. And my own illustrations would be included to give it a little more atmosphere. I had very little technology and not the best software seven years ago. However, my drawing skills have improved a bit since then, and I now have better software. So tonight, we will not be watching video games. Well, that's what I like to do best. We'll be listening to three chilling tales. Two stories written by actual authors. And one written by yours truly. Before we begin, excuse me while I take this mask off. Let's see. Where was I? Oh, yes. Now, for our first story. You ever been to a graveyard? Graveyards are like the bread and butter of ghost stories. This is where our first story takes place and features a young prankster. We will have a good prank now and then. But sometimes we all need to draw a line somewhere. Now, without further delay, let us begin our first story. The Secret of City Cemetery by Patrick Bone Only kids believed City Cemetery was haunted, but that changed the Halloween night 14-year-old Willard Armbuster disappeared. His body was never found. Willard was a bully. He had no friends. There wasn't a kid in school who would play with him. But Willard didn't mind. He liked being a bully. The older he grew, the better he became at it. Once, he told Wilma Jean Kist that her mother had been run over by a subway train. It took Wilma Jean weeks to get over Willard's joke. That didn't bother Willard. It just made him want to invent meaner pranks to play on people. That's why he was beside himself with glee when he saw city workmen digging graves at the edge of the public cemetery. They were pauper's graves, intended for persons whose families couldn't afford the fancy plots near the centre of the cemetery. 
Several graves were dug before winter frost would make digging difficult. Willard knew they would be filled in as needed. He was clever enough to see that the part of the cemetery where the graves had been dug was located next to the playground of Mark Twain Middle School. The sidewalk leading into the school playground and up to the front entrance ran beside the freshly dug graves. There was no way a kid could go in or out of the playground or school building without passing by the graves. When weather permitted, smaller neighborhood children always played in the schoolyard till dark. Willard didn't believe in ghosts. But he knew most of the kids did. He counted on that. One evening, just before dark, he snuck into the graveyard next to where some kids were playing catch on the school playground. Fall had set in, and the days were growing darker. Willard hid near the freshly dug graves. At sunset, the kids started to leave. Dark clouds hovered overhead. Wind whistled eerily through the trees. <laughs> Perfect, he snickered as he lowered himself into one of the graves using a small stepladder he had stolen for the occasion. As the kids walked near the graves, he moaned in a pathetic, pleading voice. Help me! I'm still alive! No! No! I'm alive! Please help me! The kids screamed all the way home where they told their parents that someone was buried alive in one of the graves. At first, none of the parents took them seriously. Ghost stories, they all agreed. Overreactive imagination, some said. But when Willard played the trick again, a few parents called the police. Willard was long gone when they went out to check. After a while, no one paid any attention to the kids. Police stopped checking, and the students at Mark Twain got used to the trick. They decided no one was actually buried alive. It was the ghost's way of haunting them from the graveyard. Willard had fooled everyone. At least, that's what he thought. One evening, just before the cemetery closed, Henry Grasmick, the graveyard caretaker, saw Willis sneaking into the cemetery again. Henry always ignored the occasional kid who ran in and out of the graveyard to attempt the ghost and brag about it. But what Willard had been doing was not only tempting, it was cruel. So Henry crept up behind Willard and whispered, I know what you're up to, boy. Willard jumped as if a spider had crawled up his pants. When he saw it was Henry, he didn't act as if he was afraid. Oh, get away from me, you ugly old man! he said, and spat right at Henry's shoes. Henry wasn't intimidated. You don't know what you're getting into, boy. It ain't no good to mess with the ghost. Willard laughed. <laughs> what ghost? I never saw any ghost. Even if one does exist, he can't do anything to me. Goes to spirits, old man. They can touch me. But I can touch you. He raised his fist. Which is exactly what I'll do if you snitch on me. Henry ignored the threat. 
Don't mess with the ghost, he repeated. He does exist. He has his ways. Since I was a boy, I worked here. And he left me alone. But I never messed with him. Henry turned as if he were about to leave. You don't have to worry about me telling on you, young man. You only have to worry about what the ghost is going to do to you if you keep coming here. Henry's warning had some effect, because Willa did stop his tricks at the cemetery for a time. But he stayed busy elsewhere. He almost got away with some vandalism at school, but became too sure of himself and was caught, and placed on a week's detention. He got bored. On his last day of detention, he flushed a cherry bomb down a third floor toilet, shattering the commodes on every floor below. School psychologists had to be called in to counsel the kids who happened to be sitting on the pods when they exploded. Willard was proud of his pranks. He could never forget the excitement of playing dead in an open grave. He was soon to get the thrill of his life. Halloween night, the middle school had a haunted house. To Willard, that meant one thing. Most of the kids would be there. He was delighted. Everyone who came would have to walk down the path past the open graves. No more small tricks, he thought to himself. This time, I scare all the kids. He arrived early at the cemetery and lowered himself into one of the graves, staying low so no one would see him. He even put his stepladder on the ground under him to make sure it was out of sight. The sun set. Willard watched the darkness close over his grave like a shroud. He shivered and cursed the cold. It had rained earlier. He smelled the mouldy mud squishing under his feet. Suddenly, he heard footsteps. He was about to scream out, Help me! I'm still alive! But he realised the footsteps were coming from inside the cemetery and not outside on the children's path. He froze. Not from the night chill. Is it the police, he thought? Or someone else who has discovered the tricks I've been playing? Now he was afraid, and the fear of being discovered was more than he could take. So he huddled there, as far down in the grave as he could, hoping whoever it was would go away without finding him. But the footsteps didn't go away. They got louder and closer. Maybe it isn't the police, he thought. Maybe it isn't even human. Or maybe. He didn't want to consider that maybe he had gone too far in mocking the dead. In his mind, Willard could hear the old caretaker's warning. Don't mess with the ghost boy. The ghost has his ways. The footsteps were closer now. They were heavy steps. Soon Willard realized that there were several sets of footsteps coming directly to his grave. He was too terrified to scream. All he could do was stare up at the mouth of the grave and wait. Suddenly, just above the grave, he heard groans. Heavy breathing, shuffling, 
and grunting sounds. That's when he saw it. Something long and large and black hovered over him, then inched towards him into the grave. It took Willard a split second to realize it's a coffin. And less than that to scream, No, please, I'm down here! All four grave diggers reacted the same way. They dropped the ropes holding the coffin and ran for help. The coffin fell like dead weight directly on Willard. Thump! <laughs> Knocking him cold. Minutes later, the cemetery superintendent showed up with the gravediggers to inspect the grave. There's nothing down there but a coffin, he said. Boys, I ain't got time for ghost stories. The only spirits in this graveyard are the ones you've been drinking. Now why don't you just bury that body? When Willard came to, he discovered the trick was on him. Every Halloween since, school children have claimed they could hear the muffled screams of the ghost of City Cemetery, begging to be released. Help me! Please, help me! I'm alive! No! No! I'm alive! Please, don't leave me here! Kids, always show respect at graveyards, because you may never know. Now, hope that story whets your appetite, because now it's time for our next story. Now, let's see. Hmm. Uh, ah, here we are. Now, this story is one I wrote myself, featuring a character I came up with years ago, who also appeared in a nightmare I had. Now, I'm no prize-winning author, so this one probably won't be as good as the others, but I'll let you all decide. Now, sit back, get comfy, because here we go. Time for story number two. Zachary didn't know how long he'd been out cold for. But the pain he felt in his head and the aching body. Those were the first things he noticed when he came to. He felt his forehead. There had been a cut. He thought to himself, I can tell I banged my head on something. But how? And then there was something else he noticed. A horrible, putrid Roma. He took a couple of minutes for his vision to focus, but where he ended up, he didn't know. He didn't recognize this place at all. He found himself in what looked like a living room. 
only the furniture was all dirty, rotten, dusty. Everything was unkempt. There was something about the windows while he looked around. The windows were nailed shut and boarded up. There was even barbed wire around some of them. Something about this place told Zachary that he knew he had to get out of this place. He had to tread carefully because he had a strong feeling he wasn't alone in this place. He reached for the door that led into the corridor. The putrid smell seems to be getting stronger here. He looked around the corridor as he tread carefully. The corridor was dimly lit. Littered with all sorts of rubbish, old newspapers, tin cans, mouldy food and, for some reason, there were marks in the floor and walls, like something sharp had struck them. Zachary jumped out of his skin when he heard a noise, but it was only one of the tin cans that toppled off a pile and rolled back down the corridor behind him. Shaken up a little, Zachary continued onwards. There were more doors along the corridor, but he didn't feel like exploring each room. All he wanted to do was get the hell out of this place. There was a door at the far end and hoped that this would lead to the way out. He reached the door, which was just open ajar, and pushed it open slowly. He looked into what looked like the kitchen. The smell, oh, the smell was unbearable here. Zachary only took a couple of steps when he suddenly ducked behind one of the counters in the middle of the kitchen. He peeked. There was someone in the kitchen also. There was a man there at the sink, down at the far end of the kitchen. A heavily built man. He was quite tall, wearing a stained shirt and trousers, and he appeared to be wearing an apron. There was something else about this man's appearance, but it was hard to tell since he was standing in front of the one window that wasn't boarded up. It looked like he had some kind of bag over his head, and there was a rope around his neck at the base of the bag, breathing heavily. The man was cleaning something at the sink, or at least that's what it looked like. There was a doorway leading outside to the right, and it looked like his means of escape. But how he was going to get to it without this man knowing? The man was only a few feet away from the door. Zachary then had an idea. He saw a couple of tin cans beside him, picked one up, and threw it back over towards the corridor he had just been in. The man heard it and swung around with what sounded like a wheezing noise. He then reached over and pulled up a big axe and stomped across the kitchen towards the corridor, slamming the door behind him as he left the kitchen. This was Zachary's chance. He made for the door. It was locked. Zachary started to panic. The door was locked tight, and the windows in the kitchen were either boarded up, nailed shut, or shielded with barbed wire. The man would come back at any second. Zachary searched the kitchen quickly, looking for wherever the key could be. He opened drawers, checked the cupboards, but there was no sign of a key. 
heard what sounded like the axe striking against the wall in the corridor. The man's heavy footsteps were returning, and Zachary had to hide somewhere quick. He saw one of the cupboards in the centre of the room he opened earlier, and slid down into them, closing the doors as best he could, and stayed hidden. The man's heavy footsteps entered the kitchen. Peeking through the gap of the cupboard doors, he saw the man move towards the sink, slamming his axe on the side, and return to whatever he was attending to. Zachary waited a couple of minutes until he felt it was safe to find another way out. Luckily the cupboard he had hidden and another set of doors on the other side. The man was still at the sink, and Zachary quietly crawled out of the cupboard, back to the door leading into the corridor. Not making a noise, he had reached the door, but that's when he heard the same sickening, wheezing sound he heard before. <sighs> Looking back quickly, he saw the man, had seen him, and had got his axe again. Zachary legged it. He slammed the door behind him, and had to pick a door quickly. He picked one door, and ducked into the room. Closed the door, and had to push a shelving unit that was next to it to keep the man from getting in. But for how long? The heavy footsteps moved up and down the corridor outside. The man didn't know he was hiding in this room yet. Zachary had a small amount of time to find a way out of this room he was in. The windows were boarded and surrounded with barbed wire, and there were no other doors. He had to think quickly before the axe wielding man came back to hack him to death. He looked around the room quickly, heart pelting, mouth going dry. SMASH! The axe had struck against the door behind the shelves. Zachary was running out of time. SMASH! There, in the corner, could see what looked like some kind of trap door. He dashed to the corner. SMASH! The axe blade was making its way through the shelves as wood chippings fell across the floor. Zachary grabbed the handle and tried lifting the door. SMASH! The shelves fell apart and fell across the floor. There was now a big hole from all the blows of the man's axe. Zachary got the trapdoor open and jumped down, closing the trapdoor. The heavy footsteps entered the room above him. Had the man seen him? Zachary crawled across the dusty undersection of the house. Stomp, stomp, went the man's footsteps. Zachary held his breath. Smack, went the axe. The man started striking it against the floorboards. Zachary started crawling across faster. Smash, again went the axe. Zachary Looking frantically in the gloom, saw a crawl space. He didn't care where it went right now. He just wanted to get away from this madman. Squeezing through the gap, he landed into the basement. Zachary leaned back into the brick wall, trying to catch his breath. Panting, he wiped the sweat from his forehead. 
wondering how long it would take for the man to realise where he was now. He looked around. There were some flashlights resting on containers and barrels. Zachary grabbed for one. No doubt he would need one to find his way around. He shined his lights around the basement. The basement was sort of like a maze. The passages led around corners with adjoining rooms. Every corner Zachary got to, he couldn't help but feel the man with the axe was waiting for him. But there were no heavy footsteps nearby, so he was safer now. Zachary had enough time to look around the basement. It was just as unsanitary as the rest of the house. The same awful stench, littered with rubbish. He saw what looked like a bed in the middle of a room. One of those beds hospital patients were wheeled around the corridors on. Zachary walked around it when he noticed some papers scattered across it. They looked like documents. Something about these caught his eye. He reached out for one with the documents on top of the pile. Most of these documents were covered with dirt, but this one looked sort of new. In the top left corner was a file photo of Zachary. Zachary stood there in astonishment, gripping the document. Just where did this document come from? What was this place? And who is that man with the axe? Zachary looked at his document. There was no mistake in the photograph. The document didn't have his name, age, or address, or anything. Just number 19, male, adult, black, next to his photo. He looked at the second photograph just below his file photo. It was a photo of his car, but it looked really banged up, like it had been involved in a car accident. Something struck him in the back of his mind, like something exploded. It was all coming back to him. Zachary remembered that he was visiting his friends in the next town. He was driving to them. His memory was blurry, but it was coming back. Then, a horrid crash. He then remembered being battered and banged around his car as it tumbled. He felt the cut on his forehead. He was in a car accident. But he still didn't understand why he was in this godforsaken place. Did that man with the axe find his wrecked car and abduct him? Was he even the one driving the other car? and hid him here, not to get in into a lawsuit. He looked at the document again, and saw what was typed in. Driver removed from crash scene, and brought to restricted area, currently awaiting development. That was all. Zachary then looked at the other documents. They had more details. Shuffling through the other documents, he noticed that they had more details typed in. Time elapsed. 20 minutes and 36 seconds. 5 minutes and 14 seconds. 37 minutes and 3 seconds. They all had terminated, stamped across their photos. About a dozen men and women were listed here. Adult. Teenager. Middle-aged, white, black, Asian. Zachary felt his insides churn. 
Were these poor people victims of this psychopath? He folded and pocketed a few of these documents, and hoped that if he ever got out of this place, he'd present these to the authorities and see that whoever this man is, that he'd be brought to justice. With the flashlight in hand, Zachary moved quickly, desperately looking for a way out. After moving about, he tried to find maybe a door or basement window. He saw a wooden door that led above, but it was also locked. Refusing to give up hope, he had to find something to break it open. This was a basement after all, and there had to be tools, anything. Searching quickly, he found a sledgehammer hung up on one of the walls. Returning to the basement door, he swung the sledgehammer and struck it. He struck at it again. And again. But that's when he heard the wheezes coming from another part of the basement. He had to work fast, for that man with the axe couldn't be far behind. Banging and swinging, he tried to make a hole big enough to squeeze through. The wheezing came again, and Zachary could hear the heavy footsteps against the concrete floor. After a few more swings, he made a hole wide enough to get through. Daylight seeped in, and he made his way out. Panting, Zachary made it into the open air. But there was no time to rest yet. He had to get as far away from this house as possible. So he ran. Running as fast as he could, he looked for a road, a car, anything. While running with the sledgehammer in hand, he noticed he was out in the middle of the wastelands. There were a few trees surrounding the area, but there was no time for sightseeing. He halted as there was a cross wire fence which was about seven feet tall and had barbed wire across the top. There was a road just beyond it. Frustration was kicking in. Zachary didn't have time to dig underneath. And would it even help if Zachary swung the sledgehammer on the fence? Would it even work? He took a couple of swings, desperate to get out of this place. But then, while he attempts to get free, there was a 4x4 coming down the road. Zachary waved frantically, hoping the driver would see him and help him. But it was no use. He felt a hand grip his shirt and pulled him down to the ground. Zachary didn't have a chance to swing his sledgehammer, for his captor stomped down hard on his wrist. Although pain was travelling up his arm, he only had enough time to look up at the man above him. The man was wearing some kind of bag over his head. Or was it a bag? It looked more like flesh. Pieces of flesh stitched together in several places. Two holes for eyes were cut out in a wide shape like a smile had been cut out also. And then, stop! He was out cold. Partially conscious, he could just see himself being dragged across the ground by the man, and clutching the axe with his other hand, dragging him back to the house. He fell unconscious again. Moments later, Zachary found himself hung by his wrists in the basement he had been in earlier. And out of the dark doorway, he saw the man approach slowly and wheezing. That haunting mask, that unholy mask of his own design. The man dragged his axe across the concrete floor 
and looked up at Zachary for a moment. He closed his eyes, saying a silent prayer before the axe struck the top of his head. Zachary's demise had been displayed via monitor. You did rather well, I'd say, said one of the scientists as he leaned back into his chair. <laughs> I was kind of rooting for this guy. That was a close one, however, said his colleague. Yeah, but we had our patrol car surrounding the perimeter, so everything would have been under control, of course. The director entered the control room. I see Project Axeman continues to be a success. The two scientists got up from their chairs to acknowledge the director's presence in the room. Yes, sir. And we will have the team reset everything as soon as possible. Axeman is currently residing in his confinement, but we will have everything ready for the next subject, sir said one of the scientists. The director nodded. Very good. Once everything is ready, bring in the next subject. Hopefully, the next test will be more entertaining. My team of scouts are traveling to other countries. Hopefully we'll be able to find more interesting subjects to take part in our little project. Also, Make sure that the documents are disposed of properly next time. Well, if my story didn't give you the chills, perhaps this next story which I save for last will. Now before I start the story, let me just ask you this. Do any of you believe in ghosts? Hmm? Have any of you ever seen a ghost? Well, our protagonist of our final story believes in ghosts. He's been hired to take care of a little ghost problem. Could there really be a ghost haunting this house he's about to visit? We now conclude our little Halloween treat with our final story. Ghost Hunter by Sidney J. Bounds It was already dark when Peter Matson turned into St. Agnes Road, looking for a house named Rosemont. The bright beam from his cycle headlamp swept across tall houses, some down at heel and others given a lick of paint and turned into flats. Rosemont looked behind leafless trees. A large, rambling building with high brick chimney stacks and gables. It appeared to have had a lot of extensions built onto it at different times. Peter thought it an unusual house to find in a London suburb. Like something out of Dracula. 
A single light gleamed from a downstairs window as he swung into the short drive. He saw a wooden porch and a large black door and, carved into the stonework above, a date. 1882. Peter dismounted and leaned his cycle against the porch. His legs ached and the chill wind from the dark trees froze the sweat on his body. It had been a long ride, and his saddlebags were weighted down with all his equipment. He used the old brass knocker to announce his arrival. Footsteps echoed inside, and the door opened. Peter faced a tubby man in a tweed suit. His hair was a fringe of grey about an egg-bald head, and he looked worried. Mr. Swan, I'm Peter Madsen. Sorry I'm a bit late, but the ride took longer than I expected. Uh, better late than never. Come in. Swan glanced at his watch as Peter wheeled his bike inside. I'll have to leave almost immediately. My wife's waiting for me. Marble blue eyes looked with curiosity at Peter's lanky frame, his studious expression, and thick lens glasses. In windcheater and jeans, he looks no more than sixteen. You'll be all right here, alone? Peter smiled as he shut the door. I'm not afraid, if that's what you mean. Uh, no, I suppose not, or you wouldn't be a member of a ghost hunting agency. I thought of exorcism, of course, but we don't want that kind of publicity. We'll hope you'll be discreet. Of course, we don't want publicity either. It was cold in the hall, and dust had gathered in the corners. This place is a bit of a maze, Swan said, leading the way. I've just time to show you around. A passage branched off to the right, turned left into a large, bare room, and continued again as a corridor. Swan switched on lights as he went. Here's the kitchen. Make tea or coffee if you like. Swan retraced his steps to the entrance hall. All the doors and windows are locked. There's a cellar downstairs. That's the boiler room. They went up the wide, sweeping staircase. At the top was an open door leading to other rooms, and a passageway branching away to the left. You can walk right round on this floor, the estate agent said. All the rooms are connected. Peter tried to form a mental map of the building, but the place really did seem a maze. He followed Swan along a passage that went up a short flight of stairs and down again through an L-shaped room that ended in another corridor. Finally, they arrived at the end of a branch passage and the bottom of a steep flight of stairs that angled off to the right. Swan paused. I don't believe it myself, but I'm told that some people see things about here. Peter looked up the bare wooden staircase as Swan switched on a dim light. What's up there? Just attics. I suppose they were servants' quarters. Junk rooms. Swan's tone of voice changed. I hope you can clear up this business. I can't get clients interested at all. The place has a bad name. Something so scared the previous tenants that they moved out. I'm 
glad of a chance to investigate a haunting, Peter said earnestly. So, you do believe in ghosts? I try to keep an open mind. Strange things happen. But ghosts, meaning spirits of the dead? Peter shrugged. We're still looking for the evidence. His voice dropped to a murmur, as if he was speaking more to himself than to Swan. If ghosts are the spirits of the dead, how do they feel about the afterlife? What does it feel like to be a ghost? Can a ghost feel anything at all? Swan wasn't interested. I've got to run. Just make yourself at home. I'm curious, Peter said quickly. Is there a story behind this haunting? Nothing much. The whole thing's a mystery. A young girl committed suicide here. So they say. No, nobody really knows. Peter followed him downstairs, and the estate agent gave him a spare key. He made sure the front door was locked. Alone in the old house, he went around checking doors and windows. He sealed thread across them, and left the passage lights on. Then he unpacked his saddle bags and assembled his ghost hunting equipment, setting up tape recorders and automatic cameras. He slipped a torch into his pocket. He returned to the kitchen and made himself coffee. Relaxed in a chair, he sipped slowly and listened to the sounds of the house. The creaking of timbers and crack of water pipes. The rattle of a window. Suddenly, he sat up straight in his chair, sniffing the air. He put down his mug and stepped into the passage. No, he hadn't imagined it. He could smell a woman's perfume above the aroma of coffee. In the passage, it appeared stronger. There was nothing subtle about it, just a reek of cheap scent. Peter moved along the corridor, opening doors to make sure that each room was empty. He ended back in the main hallway. Here, the perfume was almost overpowering. Saturating the air. He stared up the wide, curving staircase. In the bend, he thought he detected something grey, some slight suggestion of movement. But he wasn't sure. As he placed a foot on the lower step, the perfume vanished. His ears caught a soft laugh. So soft, he couldn't be certain he hadn't imagined it. Then, there was nothing. No perfume. No hint of movement. No laughter. He froze for a long moment, then darted quickly up the stairs and searched each room. He found no one. Peter hummed a happy tune. He was sure now that he wasn't wasting his time. When Swan opened the door the next evening, he asked, Any luck? Oh yes, we've got something here. The estate agent brightened at once. Then you'll be able to do something about it? It depends, Peter said cautiously. I can't guarantee anything. It's like this, Swan confided. I've got head office breathing down my neck. They're not interested in excuses. 
only sales. If I can't sell this place soon, it's going to count against me. Stick it out, Peter advised. A haunt of this kind doesn't usually last long. After Swan left, Peter arranged his tape recorders and cameras at the top and bottom of the main staircase. He filled a thermos flask with coffee and moved a chair into the hall, placing himself where he could watch the bend in the stairs. The hours passed slowly before the soft laugh was repeated. Peter came alert immediately. He rose from his chair and padded to the foot of the stairs. The provocative sounds came again from somewhere above. He heard the tap tap of high heeled shoes going up. And still he saw no one. The skin tightened on his scalp, lifting his hair. As the tapping sounds receded, Peter found he had to take a grip on his nerves before he could go up, but finally, he forced himself to climb to the top of the stairs. He looked down the branch passage to the left and, at the far end, glimpsed a wraith-like figure. It was an image of a girl of about seventeen or eighteen and translucent, or so it seemed. Because he could see the wall behind her, he hurried forward, and the image vanished as if a veil had dropped between them. Peter studied the walls closely, wrapping here and there. Solid. He inspected the adjoining rooms and found no sign of trickery. He went back downstairs and re-ran his tapes. The laughter and sound of high heels were there, faint, but definitely recorded. The following evening was a Friday, and Swan was going away for the weekend. Peter played the tapes for him and said, I've developed my film, and there's nothing on it. But this sort of freak happening, it's not unusual. The estate agent regarded him with a curious expression. You do realize you'll be quite alone here till Monday morning. Are you sure you'll be all right? Peter nodded. I'm not worried. Perhaps, with peace and quiet for forty-eight hours, our ghost will reveal herself. Swan shrugged and left rather hurriedly. Peter patrolled the building before taking up his post on the first floor, at the point where the ghost had vanished. But if he had expected any quick revelation, he was disappointed. Rosemont cooled and creaked as he nodded in his chair. He came to, startled, as a feminine voice purred in his ear. Soon. He was cold, and his legs were stiff as broomsticks. He glimpsed the ghost girl, distant, along the passage to the right. He rose and moved towards her. The image lingered as if waiting for him, then retreated. High heels, tap tapping to the foot of the staircase, 
leading to the attics. She seemed more solid than the previous night. She went up the flight of steep narrow stairs, reached the top and paused to look down at him. As Peter started up after her, she disappeared. He went up, holding tight to the banister rail. Moonlight, filtering through dusty windows, gave a pale glow that threw grey shadows. Yet little doubt that she had deliberately led him up here, and wondered why. He made a quick search of the attics, but discovered nothing out of the ordinary. He spent most of Saturday searching the attics thoroughly. He carried his cameras and tape recorders to the top floor, tested and placed them carefully. He had the old house entirely to himself. There were three small rooms with bare walls and floorboards thick with dust. The room furthest from the stairs still had some junk in it, broken furniture, ancient newspapers, a cracked mirror on the wall. If the ghost had lured him to this topmost floor for some revelation, she had nowhere left to go. Peter wrote a report for his agency and went out for a meal. He left it late before returning, because on the previous night, nothing much had happened before midnight. He let himself in and stood listening to the house. Then he went upstairs, switching on passage lights as he went. He paused at the foot of the narrow stairs leading to the attics. Should he wait at the bottom, or go straight up? He mentally tossed a coin, decided to play the game her way, and allow her to lure him up the stairs. He moved a chair into position and settled down for his vigil. This time, he had not had long to wait for her. Perhaps she, too, was eager for the final confrontation. Her crude perfume came first, alerting him. Then the old house became silent. The hush had a peculiar deadness to it. As if any sound were no longer possible. As he stared up the shadowed stairway, she appeared at the top. Smiling down at him, it was a smile of invitation. She seemed as real as any flesh and blood girl, and his pulse beat faster. As he went carefully up the stairs, Peter told himself she was not real. The old treads were narrow and made no sound. She waited for him in silent stillness, allowing him to approach. She was young, with an air of glamour, and her heavy scent acted like a drug. When he reached the top, she backed away along the short passage to the last room of all. The moonlight was strong and bright, and she cast no shadow, yet she saw her as plainly as any living girl. She backed up against the far wall of the tiny room until she could go no further. Peter stood in the doorway, and there were only yards between them. The mirror showed only Peter's reflection. 
His breath made no sound. Her eyes were dark pits in the pale oval of her face, and her gaze was riveted on him. Compelling, almost hypnotic. He felt strangely reluctant to move as she left the wall and glided towards him. She came closer, closer, till it seemed he sensed hot breath on his face. She wrapped her arms about him and he felt the pressure of her embrace. Her hands pressed against his back and he was engulfed in a cloud of sultry perfume. Her mouth fastened eagerly on his. It was cold, deadly cold. Her kiss turned into a dreadful, noiseless sucking and... Too late. He began to struggle. The illusion of solid flesh ended. Only the mouth was real. Frighteningly real. Sucking. Brightness exploded like a flashbulb. Sounds rushed in at him. The creak of old timbers, the rattle of a window. Sight returned slowly. By moonlight, the attic room appeared misty and insubstantial. The ghost girl had gone, and he saw another Peter walk towards the door. This other Peter paused on the threshold to look back, and his lips curved in a smile of triumph. The laugh which followed was hauntingly familiar. Peter Matson looked down at himself and discovered that he no longer had a body. The spirit of the dead girl had stolen it. He cried out, but had no voice. Terror seized him as he heard feet clatter down the stairs. Now he knew how it felt to be a ghost. He moved and made no footfalls. He drifted through a wall. Nothing was real. He had lost all sense of touch. He sank through the floor. Tears welled in his eyes that were not there, but they still blinded him. He heard the front door slam and watched the new pizza cycle away. Silence came to Rosemont. When the estate agent visited the house on Monday morning, there was no sign of Peter Matson. His equipment and cycle were gone. Swan was disgusted. The ghost hunter had left without a word. Well, he'd have something to say about that when he phoned the agency. He stayed just long enough to make sure everything was locked up and for the first time felt uneasy in the old house. Could Rosemont be haunted? Something just beyond the corner of his eyes seemed to follow him, and a noise echoed in his head.
Swan left in a hurry, slamming the door behind him, suddenly nervous. That voice? Why did he imagine the voice in his head sounded like young Peter Madsen? That concludes our Halloween treat this evening. I do hope you enjoyed the stories, though they weren't too frightening for you. Well, time is dwindling. It's time for me to go. I'll leave you with B, just so you can enjoy the rest of the festivities. As for me, I must return to the darkness below.